So I subscribe to this thing they call non-duality, but I find that not everybody talks about it in the same way. And I have a lot of problems with the kind of things that are claimed in this community. Like, I've been listening to this one particular, I hesitate to use the word teacher because she's, to a large extent, just an ordinary person. Um, I don't really want to name who this is because I don't want this to be an attack on her. But I just want to use her as an example of, uh, of the problem I'm having. I'm listening to what she's saying and she's coming out with various insights and I'm thinking, yeah, 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 that's really good. And then mm, something's just not sitting right and I'm trying to put my finger on what it is. And I think I've got it. You see, the claim is made that you can completely get rid of this thing we call ego. And by ego, I don't mean anything bad. I just mean um, sense of individual self, individual consciousness. So these people are all, they come out with language like, there's no one here. There's just what's happening. There's no I. There's just what's happening. Certain things are, thoughts are arising in, in Darl's mind. There's just, this is all just happening. There's no one here. To an extent, I, I kind of know what they're getting at because ultimately the whole universe is unified. There is, there are no separate things. Everything is one essence. I get that. But still, experientially, this is all experienced as separate things. Even though on some level you know that's not the ground of being, that this is in a sense just an experience, and we have to use words to, to separate the reality from the appearance. And separateness is just the appearance, not the reality. But it's still experienced so, this teacher had this really annoying habit of going like this. These big long pauses, like she's on some higher plane of existence or something. And I think what she's trying to do is she's just trying to let go and see what thoughts arise or something. But it looks bizarre. <laughs> but it looks like she's just not fully human. You know, like the way I'm talking to you right now, this is, this is pretty normal, right? Okay, the subject matter is not that normal, but I'm communicating with you as a, a pretty real human being here, not projecting anything. Um, not trying to put on a false persona, at least not any more false than the persona I wear <laughs> when I'm talking to, to real people and not to a, not to a camera. But this non-duality thing, there's no one there. <laughs> um, and they make quite grand claims that because no one's there, they don't really have to suffer in the way they would suffer if they believed in their own existence. This is, this is where I have a problem because this so-called, I don't know if you want to call it non-dual awareness or something, this is not going to help you in an adverse situation in life. It's not going to help you if you have to defend yourself physically or psychologically, um, it's not even going to help you if you, when you have to find food to eat, you know? And the thing that, that strikes me as so hypocritical about this is I'm watching this woman who claims to have found some special state of consciousness, but at the same time, I'm looking at the fact that she's very clearly taking time to do her eye makeup, put on lipstick, and she's obviously had her hair done by a professional hairdresser. 
And all of these things are done for the individual human organism, for the benefit of the individual human organism, perceiving itself as something distinct from its environment. Now, I know what this person would probably say to that. They would say, that's just the story of Julie. We'll just use the name Julie as an example. That's just the story of, that's just what's happening. There's no I doing that. That's just what's happening. And I get that too. I get that there's actually no I in the sense of the individual is not a thing in itself. But the language structure that this teacher is trying to put on top of all this doesn't make any difference to the life of the organism. Julie is still going to do things for Julie. It's just the same as if you never had the teaching. You see what I mean? Everything was working perfectly before, before non-dual awareness. <laughs> You see, I feel that I am real, but I also know that the universe is non-dual. It is a unity. So the way I, I integrate that is not by making the I disappear. It's by saying I and the universe are one. I, universe. So instead of disappearing the self, I extend my sense of self to include outside the body, outside the planet, and further on to encompass the entire universe, including all other living organisms that are having also an experience of the same kind of selfhood. So it's not that, you see, with this thing called the ego, again, the ego isn't a thing in itself. It's just a word that we use as a description for the experience of individual self-consciousness. That's all it is. It's just a word. It's just a concept. So it's not a villain that you have to defeat, really. Um, but if we use this word, because it is a useful word, this word ego, you can do two things with the ego that I think are wrong and result in a very unhealthy ego. Um, one is to try to destroy it and you end up in a position like, like this woman where you're, you, you're kind of putting on some kind of pretense that you're floating on air. And to some extent, it's probably not a pretense. She probably believes her own, her own uh, narrative. But to some extent, I think maybe she knows that this is a bit fake um, because she's going to do things that are very clearly nothing to do with non-dual awareness. So you can do that, but when I see a person like that, I don't find that to be a very desirable state of consciousness. It looks very emotionally flat. Now, okay, she's giving this kind of blissed outlook, but it's like, is that what I want my life to be? Just this, this bliss thing? No, life is meant to be an adventure. It's meant to have drama and ups and downs and all this kind of stuff. And um, that's the value of it, really. So I, I don't want this kind of thing that looks a little bit like you're on drugs, but you're not. So it's like you find a way to get the, you find a way to get what the drugs do without the drugs. It's almost what it looks like. So the other side of the coin is where instead of trying to defeat the ego is that uh, you get an inflated ego. And that is where you come to see, you, you develop a very narcissistic attitude where I matter, you don't matter, I matter, number one comes first. You know, that's the, the inflated ego. Now you would not develop that ego if you had an awareness of the unity of the universe, like the way that I have. Um, when I say, I, universe, I am the universe, that's not this massive statement of egotism. That's just a recognition of non-separation. So, generally, you get the inflated ego when you really believe in the separation. 
because that's when you feel completely alienated from the world. There's me, and then there's this world outside of me that is not me, that I have to dominate, that I have to control, that I have to compete with and make, get my own way. So although having, having an awareness of the non-duality of everything, although that is not going to stop the competitiveness of life, it's not going to uh, prevent you getting hurt, maybe, um, it is going to give you a perspective on that that is much more balanced in that you see yourself both as an individual and as a part of your environment that is inseparable from that environment. So it really is the healthiest way. You start to value others in the way that you value yourself. You can't obviously value everybody. If somebody is coming at you with a knife and you've got a gun, you may have to kill that person. I'm using an extreme example, of course, but you get the point. There's no point in being a doormat, in pretending that you can escape suffering when the whole world is full of it, the whole animal kingdom is full of it, our entire evolutionary history is full of strug struggle and suffering. Suffering is only one side of the picture, of course. Uh, the other side is the pleasure and the joy and the happiness. You get both in life, you know, and you can't escape both. So, I'm just going to call BS on this whole blissed out non-duality thing. Uh, I don't get it. I don't think it's for real. And I think... People prove, prove their own fakery in their own bodies. You know, if you're going to pretend to, if you're going to pretend that there's no self here in any, in any practical sense, then don't put on any makeup, don't get your hair done. Don't take care of yourself because you're not here and you don't matter. You can't say life is impersonal. When you do things that are very clearly personal, it doesn't work. So that's my take on, on non-duality and, and the place of ego within it. I want to add one final note. Um, I do think there are experiences of what we might call transpersonal consciousness or transpersonal awareness or something like that. These experiences are possible and they are valuable. And I've had, I've had something like that myself. They're certainly not necessary. Um, and I don't want to set this up as something that you have to attain before you're complete because it's not like that at all. But Back when I was a Christian, way back in my mid-twenties, I've talked about this before, but a long time ago, um, I, had a, I had a really uh, dark year where I was heartbroken after the collapse of a really important relationship. And um, for a time, I used to go out and find somewhere quiet and uh, close to nature where there were trees and stuff. And I'd sit down and it'd be evening time and it would be dark and the stars would be out. And I had this incredible sense of divinity that literally took my breath away. Now, I was a Christian at the time, and I interpreted this as what they call the presence of God. Um, and I would describe it as the feeling of being completely and utterly loved without judgment. It was like I was in a kind of a subtly altered state of consciousness where the mundane world around me seemed different. Nothing actually looked different. It's just I was somehow able to look upon it in a different way where everything, I somehow knew that behind all this, everything's all right. 
everything can't possibly be anything other than all right. And there's this undercurrent of absolute unity and love underneath everything. And I was just basking in this. And it even, although I interpreted it in a completely Christian context, it kind of surprised me because you might think that, you know, if this was just a purely, uh, a purely conditioned experience, you'd think it would be exactly what I would expect as a Christian. But it actually surprised me in that, you know, I had lived with scriptures about not only God's love, but God's judgment. And I was confronted with this experience where there was a total absence of any kind of judgment. And it's really, we it was weird, but very potent and unforgettable for me. And, um... I went through a bit of an atheist phase sometime after that, but I could never quite shake that there was something to it. I could never quite convince myself that uh, this was all just an emotional experience brought on by trauma. That may have been the trigger for it in a sense, but I think um, a large part of why I had this experience is because I felt so disconnected from my, my life and all the general concerns of life. So it was almost like a monastic thing that I was going through without trying to go through it. It was like a, almost like a hermit thing where you were disconnected from your life and so you were able to see things in a very different light that's normally veiled from people. So I look, I look back upon that now, having dispensed with Christianity, I still regard that as a very real relationship or a very real um, experience and relationship too, if you want to think about it in that way, a relationship with the unseen. Um, I don't discount it at all, and I think, I think I had this experience in spite of Christianity rather than because of it. And you know, when I talked to people around this time, although I was suffering greatly emotionally, I was really on fire spiritually in a way that I felt and in a way that others around me also felt. And even though I put a whole Christian spin on everything, um, there was, it was just dynamic. And um, I wish I could have that feeling all the time, but it's hard to get to when you're living a life and going to work and looking after material concerns and when you're filling your life with entertainments and trivial things and stresses and your entire focus is on the world in front of you and all the things about it I think it's very hard to get in touch with behind the scenes shall we say and even though I've experienced it, it's still very hard for me to do what needs to be done to pick it up again, to find that again, because it dissipated. I mean, I, li I lived with it. It wasn't just when I went out to that quiet place. I had this sense of consciousness throughout my day for a period of maybe a month or more, but it eventually dissipated. And I think it dissipated as my attachment to worldly concerns started to reform. So there's a sense in which I feel I could, I could go back to it, but what I would have to sacrifice to get back to that, the cost might be too great because I also want life to be an adventure an adventure about life. I don't want it to be about getting away from life. You see the problem? So in a sense, it's working perfectly just as it is. 
But there might be those occasions where you get a glimpse into something deeper. And when you do, treasure those moments. Because if you try to hold on to them, you have to sacrifice, I think you have to sacrifice a lot of the vitality that is in the rest of life. And I'm not sure the trade-off is worth it. Then again, I think it's also it's also possible just to put time into contemplation exercises and just to be thought to, to make sure you, you know, create enough space in your life that you can just meditate or go for long walks and appreciate just be in the moment and appreciate your surroundings and that sort of thing. So I'm kind of just I'm dropping clues of a sort because I honestly don't really know how to how to make something like that happen. It just happened to me. I know that I had an openness to me. Uh, I had a spiritual sense, a kind of a, an openness to something beyond the world of my senses. I think it's very important to have that. You know, I'm not... I'm not a theist in the Christian sense at all anymore, but I still think that the world around me is just the tip of the iceberg and that there are hidden dimensions to, to existence that, that are there, but are always veiled or often veiled. So an openness to that, an openness to the reality of that and to the notion that it can be penetrated might be the catalyst that you need to, uh, to to penetrate it. And I don't discount even the value of prayer. If it's undertaken just with the sense, not that a personal God hears you, but that everything is connected, including your will to the whole. The very definition of magic is causing change. Uh, by an act of the will. It's not so different from prayer, really, and I've said that before. So, in summary, I don't believe these non-duality teachers that, that talk about how you can defeat the ego and be blissed out for the rest of your life but at the same time, the occasional experience of some kind of transpersonal awareness is very valuable.